Cannery Row, Chapter 7, Part 1 of Chapter 7. The Palace Flophouse was no sudden development. Indeed, when Mac and Hazel and Eddie and Huey and Jones moved into it, they looked upon it as little more than shelter from the wind and the rain, as a place to go when everything else had closed, or when their welcome was thin and sear with overuse. Then the palace was only a long, bare room, lit dimly by two small windows, walled with unpainted wood, smelling strongly of fish meal. They had not loved it then, but Mac knew that some kind of organization was necessary, particularly among such a group of ravening individualists. A training army which has not been equipped with guns and artillery and tanks uses artificial guns and masquerading trucks to simulate its destructive panoply, and its toughening soldiers get used to field guns by handling logs on wheels. Mac, with a piece of chalk, drew five oblongs on the floor, each seven feet long and four feet wide, and in each square he wrote a name. These were the simulated beds. Each man had property rights inviolable in his space. He could legally fight a man who encroached on his square. The rest of the room was property common to all. That was in the first days when Mac and the boys sat on the floor, played cards, hunkered down, and slept on the hard boards. Perhaps, save for an accident of weather, they, may, they might always have lived that way. However, an unprecedented rainfall, which went on for over a month, changed all that. House-ridden, the boys grew tired of squatting on the floor. Their eyes became outraged by the bare board walls. Because it sheltered them, the house grew dear to them, and it had the charm of never knowing the entrance of an outraged landlord. For Lee Chong never came near it. Then, one afternoon, Huey came in with an army cot which had a torn canvas. He spent two hours sewing up the rip with fishing line, and that night the others lying on the floor in their squares watched Huey ooze gracefully into his cot. They heard him sigh with abysmal comfort, and he was asleep and snoring before anyone else. The next day, Mac puffed up the hill carrying a rusty set of springs he had found on a scrap iron dump. The apathy was broken then. The boys outdid one another in beautifying the palace flophouse until after a few months it was, if anything, over-furnished. There were old carpets on the floor, chairs with and without seats. Mac had a wicker chaise lo lo lounge painted bright red. There were tables, a grandfather clock without dial face or works. The walls were whitewashed, which made it almost light and airy. Pictures began to appear mostly calendars showing improbable luscious blondes holding bottles of Coca-Cola. Henri had contributed two pieces from his chicken feather period. A bundle of gilded cattails stood in one corner, and a sheaf of peacock feathers was nailed to the wall beside the grandfather clock. They were sometime acquiring a stove, and when they did find what they wanted, a silver-scrolled monster with floriated warming ovens and a front like a nickel-plated tulip garden, they had trouble getting it. It was too big to steal, and its owner refused to part with it to the sick widow with eight children whom Mac invented and patronized in the same moment. The owner wanted a dollar and a half and didn't come down to eighty cents for three days. The boys closed at 80 cents and gave him an IOU, which he probably still has. This transaction took place in Seaside, and the stove weighed 300 pounds. Mac and Huey exhausted every possibility of haulage for 10 days, and only when they realized that no one was going to take this stove home for them did they begin to carry it.
It took them three days to carry it to Cannery Row, a distance of five miles, and they camped beside it at night. But once installed in the palace flophouse, it was the glory and the hearth and the center. Its nickel flowers and foliage shone with a cheery light. It was the gold tooth of the palace. Fired up, it warmed the big room. Its oven was wonderful, and you could fry an egg on its shiny black lids. With the great stove came pride, and with pride the palace became home. Eddie planted morning glories to run over the door, and Hazel acquired some rather rare fuchsia bushes planted in five-gallon cans, which made the entrance formal and a little cluttered. Mac and the boys loved the palace, and they even cleaned it a little sometimes. In their minds, they sneered at unsettled people who had no house to go to, and occasionally, in their pride, they brought a guest home for a day or two. Eddie was understudy bartender at La Ida. He filled in when Whitey, the regular bartender, was sick, which was as often as Whitey could get away with it. Every time Eddie filled in, a few bottles disappeared, so he couldn't fill in too often. But Whitey liked to have Eddie take his place because he was convinced, and correctly, that Eddie was one man who wouldn't try to keep his job permanently. Almost anyone could have trusted Eddie to this extent. Eddie didn't have to remove much liquor. He kept a gallon jug under the bar, and in the mouth of the jug there was a funnel. Anything left in the glasses Eddie poured into the funnel before he washed the glasses. If an argument or a song were going on at La Ida or late at night when good fellowship had reached its logical conclusion, Eddie poured glasses half or two-thirds full into the funnel. The resulting punch, which he took back to the palace, was always interesting and sometimes surprising. The mixture of rye, beer, bourbon, scotch, wine, rum, and gin was fairly constant, but now and then some effete customer would order a stinger or an anisette or a curacao, and these little touches gave a distinct character to the punch. It was Eddie's habit always to shake a little angostura into the jug just before he left. On a good night, Eddie got three quarters of a gallon. It was a source of satisfaction to him that nobody was out anything. He had observed that a man got just as drunk on half a glass as on a whole one, that is, if he was in the mood to get drunk at all. Eddie was a very desirable inhabitant of the palace, flop house. The others never asked him to help with the house cleaning, and once Hazel washed four pairs of Eddie's socks. End of part one. To be continued.